Welcome to this third session on the Divine Plumb Line series. In the first session, we talked about the identity questions, questions that we need to be considering in our own lives in order to discover significance and meaning and purpose. And in the second session, we went to talk, went on to talk about identity crises and some of the ways identity crises begin to develop in our lives. We are using as a basic theme this vision that we see here on the chart of a plumb line and a wall. That uh, this vision comes right out of the book of Amos, chapter 7. God was speaking to him about his judgments on the children of Israel in the northern kingdom. And uh, in the process of that, to help Amos understand what was going to happen, he gave him this vision. And this vision is very significant as we will see as we go on through the series. In fact, the series is a meditation on this vision and its significance in our own lives today. We also saw that as a result of us having false plumb lines, false reference points in life, if you like, we can begin to build up certain personality traits. For example, as we see on this next chart, when we have a plumb line that is in the passive position uh, relating to rejection, there are certain traits that we automatically begin to build up into our lives. A classic example of this, uh, you'll, see in the, you'll see as you review back in the second session, uh, is Saul, as he began to feel more and more rejected over being the king of Israel. In the New Testament, an example of that is Judas, who finally finished up down here committing suicide. And uh, you can review some of the passages there in your notes on the second session to understand more a visual uh, right out of the scripture there that illustrates this whole area uh, in rejection. We also saw how when we have a reference point in rebellion, then uh, we begin to build up personality traits on this other side. What we're going to do in this session is go on further and look at some of the detail of how the enemy sets us up for an identity crisis because that's, a game he's continually playing with our lives and he's a master at it. And so we're going to see how he continues in this process, first of all, of taking out truth and love from our lives, particularly during those early developmental years and giving us a reference point in rebellion or rejection. And then after that, not only do these personality traits uh, begin to emerge, but we can see actually that some personality profiles begin to surface. And we're going to take a look at the two bricks, walls, the two brick walls that we had here, just to see four potential possibilities that can develop in terms of personalities. We'll draw a line right across here and we'll divide this up into four quadrants. On this side, one and two are relating to the plumb line in rejection. On this side, three and four are relating to the more aggressive position in rebellion. What I want for us to do in this uh, session is consider the two passive kinds of personalities that can develop. So we're going from the traits to the profiles. And we're going to look at uh, four different profiles to help us see more clearly how personality develops. Because personality is a vital part of identity. And if our personality is askew or if it's off-center, then uh, identity crises are easily uh, experienced. In this first uh, quadrant, we see a personality that really has a great struggle with authority figures. And uh, she is doing everything that she can do to please her leader. 
And so as we look at this profile, uh, we'll see that she's making a couple of statements that are very important in, in terms of her lifestyle. And the first one is, please love me. And of course, this is a statement that's coming right out of the challenge of the love deficit that we talked about uh, in the earlier session. This is the great motivation behind everything that she does is a desire to be loved. And in exchange for this, she makes this kind of statement. I'll do anything you want. Now, what do you think about this kind of contract in terms of a relationship? Suppose you were her, her leader or her director. How would you feel about building a relationship with this kind of personality? What kind of things would you struggle and wrestle with? Well, you would find that she would be quite a drain off in terms of energy in relationship with you because she will be continually demanding expressions of love and affirmation in a variety of ways. If you're unable to produce, then uh, she will begin to move into a crisis and then have some reactions that uh, could be adverse in your relationship. So you see that this kind of motivation is, uh, is, can be quite a disruptive one and quite a draining one. There are a couple of things, too, relating to this other statement, I'll do anything you want. This is an unprincipled statement because it means that anything you want, I'll do if you can give me love. And this is a contract in a relationship. It's not an uncommon contract. In fact, it's a very common contract in relationships today. The great problem with this kind of contract is that we can't meet one another's love needs. We cannot meet one another's love needs. We can meet some of them, but we cannot meet all of them. There's only one person who can really meet all of our love needs, and that's God. And so what happens in this kind of relationship is this person is putting pressure on you to be God in their life. That's why after the honeymoon is over, the storm comes in and the relationship gets rocky because the wife realizes her husband is not God. Well, the husband realizes his wife cannot give him all the love that she, he expected from her. And so the relationship begins to break down because the contract wasn't being kept. There, there is a, a false belief that we need to look at in this kind of personality. And uh, it's this, that I must be approved Underline must. I must be approved by certain significant people. And the reason for that is so that they can have value or worth and that they can feel that their life is worthwhile. And if that approval is not there by those significant others, then value begins to drop off and uh, this individual can begin to have a tremendous inner struggles uh, in their life and relationships. As a result of uh, having to have this approval, we see there are certain fears that come into this personality's life. For example, a fear of failure, because if they fail, uh, then they are not able to receive the love input that they are looking for. Uh, certainly an ongoing fear of rejection, uh, rejection around every corner, and a fear of criticism. This also can be very difficult for this kind of personality. They are driven 
to please. That's the major motivation in behind all of their relationships. And so there's a big challenge here. If we take a look at some other aspects in relationship to this person, we can see a little bit more clearly some statements that would help us understand uh, their, their real position. One, they need to be needed. And if they're in a relationship where they don't feel that, they'll soon get out of that relationship. Two, they create needs, if need be. In other words, it's through needs that they can please and they can have love. When they give, it's always with a thought of return. In other words, it's a conditional relationship that they are forming with you. And if the return is not there, the relationship, again, can begin to weaken. Because they are such uh, givers, they will often wear themselves out for others. And this is the kind of person who very easily goes on in giving and giving and gives themselves away. And, of course, what they're trying to do is make up the love deficit. They can even get to the place where they become a martyr for others. By that I mean they, they lose themselves. They die to who they really are. And then they come to the place where they don't really know who they are. And they are very vulnerable to all kinds of crisis in that position. The next point we see is the potential for burning out. And uh, we need to recognize that there are a number of, uh, of Christians in the service of God and also on the mission field who are struggling today with this whole area of burnout. And we have to ask the question, why? Does Jesus burn out his disciples? Where does burnout come from in this whole area of frontier missions? What's the burnout drop out? And where is the burnout coming from? I want to suggest that this is one very common source when a person is trying to serve the Lord and build relationships off of this kind of platform. Psychosomatic problems are where the stress and the strife going on inside gets too much for the person to contain, and it spills out in physical symptoms, aches and pains and um, bowel problems and skin problems, these kinds of things. And so uh, these are some of the things that we can expect when we are living this kind of lifestyle and we have this kind of contract in our relationships. King Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 15 is a biblical example of this. We see how God called him to go and slay this enemy king called Agag and just totally annihilate everything because there was so much evil there. In 1 Samuel 15, we see that he went and he not only spared the king, but he also spared some of the livestock and brought them back to Samuel the prophet. Samuel went out and challenged him and Saul's response we see in 1 Samuel 15, verse 24. Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. What's this saying? It's saying that Samuel's fear of the people was greater than the fear of the Lord. This was the kind of relationship that he was living out. And so he began to lose the kingdom from that time on. This personality profile is also one that I can relate to because for many years of my life and Christian life, I lived like this. I was searching for love through relationships with people. And I went through a series of disappointments and discouragements uh, because people just couldn't give me the kind of love that I really wanted. I got into the whole area of, of uh, medicine. I got into the area of counseling to serve and to give and to help others in order to have the return of affirmation and love to facilitate uh, some compensation for my love deficit. So many years of my life, I was serving God like this. And of course, I got close into burnout. I had psychosomatic symptoms. I began to lose who I really was. 
by giving myself away to others. And so I can relate very much to this personality and have had some big struggles in coming out of this personality and discovering who I really am and living freely in who God has called me to be. Now this person, when they come out, had the potential to uh, show pastoral giftings, usually, yeah, because we see when they begin to move from a false plumb line and a rejection to a true plumb line, then they begin to be able to give unconditional love. Of course, this is something that God gives to us. He models to us, and he's wanting to lead us into this. Also, they are affectionate and warm in relationship toward others. That's not difficult because that's also been a part of their past. They are thoughtful and kind, caring and helpful, and serving, but, but this time without conditions. It's an unconditional love, and it's an unconditional serving. So... Uh, we can see here in this kind of personality profile that uh, there can be a great struggle until this person goes through a crisis and really begins to find a new reference point in their lives. Now, there's a second profile that relates into this whole area in passivity, and this is the second one. On the, uh, in the walls that we looked at earlier. It's in the lower left-hand quadrant. And you'll see this person, instead of reaching out to relate to the authority figure, as number one did, the compliant personality, the can't do it tends to be turning away from the authority figure. And uh, they are not a great help in the team. In fact, it's a great struggle to, to work with them. Because basically, they have two statements that are bottom line. And the first one is, nobody loves me. Meaning that they have given up. And oftentimes, they have tried and tried and tried. But come to the place where in reality, no one really does love me. And I'm not even sure if God loves me either. And this is the kind of position this person comes to uh, through a series of broken relationships. And the consequence of this is I give up. And that's a natural consequence because if there's no love for me, that means I don't have any value. So why should I continue uh, in a position and in a situation where I have no value. And so this person begins to move very much away from relationships and tends to withdraw from activities and also from people. Basically, their false belief is <laughs> that I am what I, what I do. And I've been failing and failing over and over again. That's what I do best, to fail. And so I am a failure. I am a nobody, basically. <laughs> I'm a can't do it. And so you see, this person really has a very negative perspective on life, but it all can be related back in to the influence of the love deficit in early developmental years, and that love deficit being reinforced, reinforced through a series of broken relationships. So the consequences of having a, having a life statement uh, like this is, <coughs> in terms of emotions, I wrestle with a lot of shame and easily feel shame. <coughs> also, I struggle with guilt. We need to recognize the difference between shame and guilt here. <coughs> guilt is relating to what I do. If I do something wrong, I can feel guilty, and perhaps I might take responsibility and repent over that. But shame is relating to who I am. So shame says, 
when I do something wrong. I am wrong. And so shame begins to affect my personhood. I am a failure. I am stupid. I am dumb. Those are shame words. Parents sometimes use shaming words to get their children to perform better. But they don't realize, in fact, what they are doing in heaping shame up on their child. Because those words get echoed over and over again in the spirit of the child and on in, through the developmental years and on into adulthood even. So uh, this person is very susceptible to shame and wrestles with a lot of, uh, a lot of depreciation of their true value and worth. And it's a great challenge for them to rise up out of this position and break out of that, that passivity that locks them down in there. With regards to some of the factors that this person wrestles with, we can see in this next uh, chart that the can't do it uh, is often self-absorbed. And they get into situations where they are just overwhelmed with what's going on in themselves, self-absorbed self and self-centered. And of course, because of that, they, they can become very moody and very melancholic. And uh, in relationships, this can be a very difficult thing to bear, especially in the marriage or in the family. It's natural, of course, that when we have this perspective, this belief about our lives, that we will experience depression more and more and even uh, deeper and deeper simply because of the negative thoughts and feelings that we continue to feed into ourselves. Self-pity is a brick or personality trait we looked at earlier. This person has a lot of sorrow for themselves, but uh, it's a struggle for that sorrow to actually bring a change. Self-contempt, they go into the place where they begin to think uh, negative and bad thoughts about themselves, putting themselves down, not only in their own thoughts, but also in front of others as well. Self-hatred, uh, this is a bread in this kind of situation because the person is going into a mode of becoming more and more against themselves. Shame we've talked about in escapism, the pain of a position, being in a position like this can be overwhelming. And eventually the person can uh, say, I can't handle this anymore and go out into, uh, into the world and handle it the way the world handles crises like this through sex or drugs or alcohol or whatever. So escapism is something that eventually this person can come to. Well, there was a... Uh, a woman who had a family of six children, and these children were very close together. They had four boys and two girls, and it came to the place where she just couldn't handle six children so close together and with all the other responsibilities of uh, being a wife. Her husband was not very affirming or understanding, and so she did not receive a lot of uh, love uh, through him, and as a result, she began to get deeper and deeper into this can't do it uh, position and uh, just eventually gave up on being a mother and being a wife and gave up on the family, and the kids just lived wild. Her escapism was into, the, into TV and into Hollywood, the Hollywood world, and she would sit there for hours. In fact, she developed an illness or sickness that kept her there uh, looking at the television uh, for hours and hours, but that she escaped into that fantasy world. And uh, there are many who, who sink into this, this uh, depth of, of despair and discouragement over life. Another, uh, a biblical example, uh, we can see in Exodus chapter 3, and that's uh, Moses. We looked at Moses earlier on, uh, but let's take a look at him here with regards to the challenge that God brought into his life to be the deliverer for his people, he 
battled and wrestled uh, with God's call and uh, gave excuses in chapter 3 here, like that I can't speak uh, or I am a nobody. And uh, so, God, you've got the wrong person. And uh, as a result, we see God was quite upset with him. But Moses really had sunk down into this profile position because of the crises that he had walked through. And he was in a place where he was giving up. And uh, that's exactly where we find this kind of personality and when the uh, prerequisites are all set in place and that there are some of these traits and there's a plumb line in rejection. When this person changes, and we'll talk a little bit later on about how change occurs, <coughs> they have the potential to release the giftings of a, of a teacher and also um, artistic giftings and abilities. Uh, usually when they come out from their position, they are very self-aware and they understand a lot of what's going on once revelation comes. And, and they're also very intuitive. They can perceive things that others just go by and miss altogether. They're also very sensitive to where others are at because remember they've walked out of a lot of injury and pain in their inner selves themselves. And gentleness is a great mark of this kind of personality as well because they, uh, they recognize <coughs> the need for this in relationships, particularly because they were wounded by those who were not so gentle with them when they were uh, in a previous position. Compassionate, they have a lot of potential there. Being creative, artistic, romantic. In one of our counseling schools, there was a young man in Europe who came and he was really the can't do it personality and that was obvious after the first week or two. <laughs> but as God began to work with him through this series and other teachings that we built into the, the counseling school over those three months, his eyes began to get opened and he began to have a revelation of himself and a deep brokenness came into his life and uh, he began to take responsibility for where he had been and how he had been living and uh, God facilitated through his grace, helping him to find a new plumb line uh, that was more closer to where God's plumb line was. And today he is a, a powerful teacher and he's also a publisher uh, running his own company and uh, is, is, a, is very artistic and romantic, even though he's still a single man. I won't give you any more details there, but... Uh, We've seen wonderful transformation in this young man coming out of the can't do it into uh, giftings, both of being a teacher and also very artistic. He's become a very good friend uh, since that time. So we can see here from this profile that uh, the plumb line or reference points in our lives are very important. They can close life down or they can open it up and release it to us. Now, what I want us to look at next is in your study guides, this whole area of the lust trap. Because both of these personalities coming from where they do are very vulnerable to this trap. In fact, the lust trap is uh, just the next step away from the battles and struggles that they have in their uh, personality profiles. We'll look at 1 John chapter 2, uh, verses 15 and 16, in order to understand a little bit more in this area. 1 John 2, 15. Do not love or cherish the world or the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love for the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the Amplified calls that the craving for sensual gratification, and the lust of the eyes, that is the greedy longings of the mind, and the pride of life, these do not come from the Father, but are from the world. 
and the world passes away and disappears, and with it these cravings. But he who does the will of God and carries out his purposes in his life remains forever. This is a very powerful scripture, and you'll notice that John speaks about lust and love in an almost interchangeable way. And what he's highlighting here for us is that lust and love have become synonyms in our contemporary language. So we find it difficult to differentiate between the two out there in the world at least. But John is saying the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eye are two great areas of uh, vulnerability for these two personality profiles. One, the compliant, and two, the can't do it. Why? Because when things don't work out, what happens is, as a result of the rejection, which is this swing A here, rejection, they begin to experience pain. And they don't know what to do with that pain, particularly as the rejection goes on and on and continues to be a struggle for them. What often happens is that as they wrestle with this pain, there comes under scene a pleasure. And of course, this is a trap that is set by the enemy, so he usually understands those things that are, are pleasures for us. And we partake of the pleasure and find relief from the pain. But then we swing back here to the midline until we receive another stimulus of rejection. Because life is like that. There's rejection out there if we are looking for it, and even if we're not. So what happens when rejection comes again, this person swings back to the pain. And, of course, by now they are realizing there is some relief in the pleasure, and so they uh, swing over to the pleasure. Now this is something that many people do to uh, compensate. Uh, for pains of various kinds in life. <clears throat> but we're, we need to be careful in this kind of situation is when we begin to drift into deeper and deeper into the pleasure as an analgesic for the pain. As that happens, there's a shift of the cycle in this direction until eventually we can see here that the cycle finishes up around the pleasure, and the pleasure now has been empowered. So the pleasure now is controlling us and is taking over our lives. And uh, we have a great difficulty breaking out of that. This is what I call the lust trap. It's a summary, in a sense, of what John is talking about in verses 15 and 16 of chapter 2. So as we go deeper and deeper into this lust trap, the pleasure becomes addictive. In fact, this is how addictive behaviors result. They develop as a result often of pain that we cannot bear and a pattern of escaping into a pleasure of one kind or another. And there's a whole variety of different pleasures that we try to escape into. Of course, uh, there are those that are more common uh, in life, and we, we see this, for example, in a patient who came to my uh, clinic one day, and she said, I'm, I'm overweight, and I, I, I really needed some medication to help me because I don't like myself with so much weight on. So I said, do you mind if I ask you a few questions before I give you a prescription? She said, no, that's okay. I said, uh, how much do you eat? And she said, well, not very much, actually. That's what I don't understand. Well, how often do you eat? <laughs> and we began to realize she was eating quite frequently right through the day. 
And I said, well, tell me a little bit about your husband. And she was quiet for a moment. Then I probed her a little bit more, and she said, well, he's an alcoholic. So what was going on in this marriage, in this home? He was escaping from his pain into alcohol, and he had now become an alcoholic. And of course, that's a classic example of the lust trap and how alcohol not only begins to destroy the, the person physically, uh, but also emotionally and spiritually, and also begins to destroy marriage and family and all those things that mean anything. And uh, that's the effects of the lust trap. In order to cope with the pain in her marriage and her family, she was eating. And so she was going into the same trap, but using food as a form of escape. And of course, these are days in which we see a lot of eating disorders emerging. A lot of young people are struggling with eating disorders, even Christian young people, even uh, those out in missionary work and serving God. Uh, and where there's a lot of demand and pressure and there's pain with it, this can be a form of escape. Bulimia, for example, uh, where a person sits down and eats huge amounts of food at once and then has to purge it out or throw it up. And this uh, can actually lead to very serious uh, medical condition of electrolyte imbalance, which can be life-threatening. And uh, there are other examples like that in the whole uh, food situation. But we, another aspect or illustration here in the pain-pleasure swing is the whole sexual appetite. There's a whole variety of uh, expressions or illustrations in this uh, aspect of the lust trap, where, for example, uh, people contract uh, venereal disease and, of course, the AIDS epidemic. And then there's the sexual abuse that gets carried on from one generation to another. Uh, all of this links up to the lust trap. And it often goes back to unrelenting pain that the person doesn't know what to do with and doesn't know how to resolve. So there are other examples that we could look at, but I just want to take this opportunity just to share a little bit about my own life and be a little bit more personal here. I grew up in a larger family, and uh, we uh, had to compete a little bit for love. And in that setting, while there was a lot of things that were expressed to us in terms of love, there was not a verbalizing of love. And so I can't remember the words being spoken out to me, uh, I love you. And something inside of me longed to hear those words as a child growing up, just to hear that somebody say, I love you. But they were not there. I didn't uh, judge or blame my parents for that. I just accepted it as a matter of form or culture or whatever, but that didn't take away the deep longing in my heart. Some uh, years later, when I was in elementary school, there was a reinforcement of what I am explaining here as a, of a, as a love deficit. I was uh, stood up in the class by a teacher in elementary school who found an area of weakness in me and made a joke of it in front of the class. And the class laughed and I was embarrassed and went the different colors of the rainbow and sat down and tried to hide myself behind, my, behind the desk. That was okay, except the teacher, having realized that I was vulnerable in this area, began to use me to lighten the mood of the class when things got a little bit dry or boring. And, and so I became a kind of a joke in the class. And uh, being a rather sensitive personality, I took that very hard. And what happened was that I began to have a fear of going into the classroom. And I withdrew from participation. I wouldn't put my hand up to answer questions or to respond, even though I knew the answers, because of the fear of being laughed at and the fear of rejection, the fear of more pain, because this is where I was finding myself, right here uh, in the classroom context. 
Well, it was a very difficult time for me, and I discovered that through eating between classes, I could find some relief from the pain. And so that's what I did. I had a little storehouse where I kept food, and in between classes, I would go and have a little nibble. And that brought some degree of relief. But what happened was that I became more and more dependent on that uh, kind of relief. And if the class went on too long, I found myself just in, a, in quite a state because I couldn't get to have something to eat so I could last out the next class. The other kind of pleasure that the enemy began to seduce me into, because he's the author of The Lust Trap, was uh, unclean thoughts. And there were many of these in the classroom. And so as I listened to my classmates, I would get, gather a catalog of unclean thoughts, and my mind became a garbage can as a result. <clears throat> because I realized that I didn't have to wait for a break for this kind of pleasure to relieve my pain. I could just turn it on any time. So this led me to a position where I, uh, I had a tremendous struggle with unclean thoughts, and particularly when I became a Christian. Uh, I found myself in a place where uh, I was saying to God, if you can't clean up my mind, then I can't follow you. I can't be a Christian. I cannot live with a mind like this and say I'm a Christian. And uh, the harder I seemed to fight that, the more difficult it was. And also I was praying about this whole area of food and the lust for food. And because of this, the strength of lust in my life, I, I had not really experienced what the love of God was. I'd really come to Christ because I became convicted and realized I did need him. But I had not really broken through to experience his love because there was too much lust in the way. Because lust and love are opposites, remember. And if we give ourselves to lust, we begin to rob ourselves of love and the potential for love. So this is the place where I found myself battling and wrestling. And I'll share a little later on how God helped me to break out of this trap. But I'm just taking this moment of time so that we can identify because there are many and many in the world who are caught in this trap and too many Christians like I was struggling and battling to break out of this trap uh, in one way or another. I... Uh, in the course of working with patients and counselees over the years, have found myself inevitably uh, where there's relational conflict or where there's pain, having to deal with a lust problem. What often happens, of course, in a counselling session is that we are counselled to deal with the lust and confess it and repent over it, but the pain is not addressed. And so what happens is we develop what we call a besetting sin because we can't handle the pain. So if we don't go back into the same pleasure, we find another one. For example, a person manages to stop the cycle of overeating and weight gain. And what happens? They start smoking. And they smoke and smoke. Or they stop smoking and they eat. So basically what's going on is they're just exchanging the pleasure. The cycle continues on, but they're just bringing in another pleasure to substitute. And that's not really a victory. It's not really a breaking free out of this whole area of the lust trap. So the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eye are not of the Father, but they are of the world. And those who give themselves in this area are passing away. Now you'll see at the end of this uh, session three, on the passive personality profiles, a couple of questions here. And I'd encourage you just to take some time out to uh, describe some of the inner pains that you've experienced and how you handled them, and also talk about some of the consequences of those pains in your own life. And God encourage you and give you revelation as you do. Thank you. <laughs>